Today we're talking about a very important subject, and it's the title is actually a question. When has the truth not mattered? We say, well, the truth matters. Has there ever been a time when truth hasn't mattered or hasn't been important? Today we hear a lot about this concept of my truth or your truth. And on January the 8th of 2018, Oprah Winfrey was, of course, a very well-known person. She was at the Golden Globes Award, and she was speaking there, and she made this statement that I thought was very interesting. She said, what I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. Speaking your truth. What does she mean when she says your truth? Does this mean that our truths could differ? Does this woke idea of everybody having their own truth, does it, does it really fit with reality? For example, in the 1930s and 1940s, Adolf Hitler had his view of what was truth. His truth to him was to annihilate 8 million Jews and many hundreds of thousands of Slavs and Russian prisoners. And they set up concentration camps and uh, death camps to do this. Here's a picture of the Auschwitz camp, uh, and uh, I've been there twice. I've seen these uh, ovens that you're going to see in this next picture on the lower left. These ovens used to incinerate the dead bodies of people who had been gassed, even little children like these prisoners here that were shown that were liberated. Adolf Hitler had his truth. Did that make it truth? He had a contemporary by the name of Joseph Stalin, and Stalin put over 18 million of the Russian people through the Gulag prison system during his lifetime. Many million more killed without even going through the Gulags. But did that mean that Stalin's truth was truth? Was it his truth or was it actually a lie? This last week we have been experiencing and seeing experience, we haven't experienced maybe, but we've, we've certainly heard the news of the conflict going on over in the Gaza area between Hamas and Israel. And many hundreds of people have already died in this conflict because Hamas has a version of what they consider to be truth, and others have a version of their truth. President Biden seems to have an ability to explain his truth. For example, he has claimed that he was at ground zero on 9-12, the day after 9-11, when in fact he was not. According to the president, in the past, he was arrested during a civil rights protest, but in reality, an officer simply escorted him home after the demonstration. Biden claimed that he visited the synagogue in Pittsburgh, where there was a mass shooting in 2018, and even spoke with the rabbi, but the reality is the president never visited. Does the president have his truth? Does Satan have his truth? And Friends, should we agree with that truth? Now, the dictionary says that truth is that which is in accordance with fact or reality. In other words, truth is that which agrees with reality, what the truth really is, what reality really is. And if my truth, think about this for a minute, if my truth includes the belief that I can put poison in your food, should you accept my truth because I claim it to be my truth? You would understand very quickly that that just doesn't fit, that doesn't work. And friends, God is calling us to understand truth and to be sanctified by the truth, to be a holy people. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, the apostle says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And friends, we can, cannot have any measuring stick, any standard for what is holiness, if there is no fundamental understanding of what is truth. To be holy is to be godlike in character. And we are to be partakers, the Apostle Peter says, of the divine nature. Not that we become divine, not that we become gods or demigods, but rather that we partake of this character, this divine character of God. Now, ask your question simply, how much does God value truth? 
How important is truth to God? And I think we can see the answer to this in a couple of key verses in John chapter 17. In Christ's high priestly prayer, in John 17, verse 17, speaking to the Father, he says, sanctify or make them holy. Set them apart for holy use. Make them holy. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And in verse 19, he says, And for their sakes, referring to his disciples and those who would follow after him, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they might also be sanctified through the truth. And so, friends, it's through the truth that we are sanctified. It's through the truth that we are made holy. But if the truth is malleable, if it's fluid, if, it's, if, if, if it has different meanings depending on different people, then we have no standard of holiness by which we can be sanctified. But friends, our God is a God of truth. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, it says, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. The Bible says that our God, our Father, is a God of truth. He is a God of that which agrees with reality. And Jesus, speaking in John 14 and verse 6, stated that he is the way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we have a God of truth. His Son is the truth. He is the truth, the embodiment, the truth of the Father. And their spirit is the spirit of truth. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, 16, and 17, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Here Jesus called this Spirit the Spirit of truth. And in John 15 and verse 26, he again speaks about the spirit of truth. Not a spirit of error, not a spirit of, of some fluid, malleable uh, set of codes or, or ways, but the spirit of truth. And in John 16, 13 again, he speaks about the spirit of truth. There's no question, friends, that everything about God is truth. The word truth is used 237 times in 224 verses in the Bible. It's not a light matter. And this concept of truth is throughout all the Bible. The word true is used 81 times in 77 different verses. So there is value in truth. But Satan's plans, friends, they, they, they basically continue on from the beginning. He just remodels his ideas and puts them in new packages, and there's nothing new under the sun with him. And what we see today in this idea of having our truth, your truth, my truth, is something that Satan has been working at since Adam and Eve. He introduced the concept of having your own truth to Eve in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It says that the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. This was the truth of God. They were not to partake of that tree. If they would partake of that tree, death would certainly be the result. Now, did God mean this? He absolutely meant it. But Satan came along with his truth. And the serpent said unto the woman, unto Eve, in Genesis 3, 4, Ye shall surely die. Is that what he said? Did he agree with God? No, he added in a word, just a single word as it were. But that single word made the difference. Ye shall not surely die. In fact, in the Hebrew, the, 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 what we have the words, ye shall, are not actually in the text. Now, grammatically, they need to be put there. But in the Hebrew, it is simply the words, uh, not, die, die. 
In other words, die, die. It's put there for a double emphasis. You shall not surely die. You will not die. But was this the truth? Eve must have thought it was at first. She must have thought, well, God's truth is not so important. My truth is my powerful tool, and I must use my truth. Just like Satan's agent, Oprah Winfrey, would say almost six millennia later, over seven, six millennia later. But friends, God's truth is important. And Jesus is the faithful and true witness. And he had a testimony about Satan and about Satan's truth. And that testimony we find in John chapter 8 and verse 44. Speaking to some of the leaders of the Jewish nation, he said, Ye, now ye is a, a, a it's second person plural, right? So he's speaking not just to one person, but he's speaking to all those Jewish leaders. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so, beloved, when we're not teaching truth, when we are varying from the truth, we are lying, and we are of our father, the devil. But we need to be of our heavenly father, and he is a God of truth. His son is the truth. They have the spirit of truth. And God wants his people to be sanctified by the truth. It is only the truth that will make us holy, that will make us like God in character. Adam and Eve didn't, didn't believe God. They thought their truth would be better. But friends, they did die because their truth did not trump or overcome the truth of God. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, God said that in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and in the dust shalt thou return. And so I ask you, friends, is God particular about his truth? Because his truth is the only truth there is. Adam and Eve lost the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life because God's truth matters. And friends, if we don't believe God's truth matters to us in these last days, we will lose out on the Garden of Eden, which will be restored in the earth made new. And we will lose out on the Tree of Life, and not just temporarily, but for eternity. Now, as I thought about this subject and began to think of various stories and, and uh, incidences in the Bible, it seems to me that almost in every case that you read about, you read about something about truth mattering and how truth is important. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about the, the wickedness of that city. Those people lived according to their own truth. And God destroyed that city. He destroyed that wickedness. And today, there are people who claim that this LGBTQ+, plus, because who knows how much more they're going to add to it, that this movement is a movement of truth. It's a movement of truth that, that lets everyone define what is right, that God made me this way. Even though God considers my lifestyle in other places an abomination, well, he made me this way, so it must be okay with him. But friends, let God be true and every man a liar. God says that these lifestyles are an abomination and that those who continue to practice them will be lost forever. Now, I want to just make a word of caution here, friends. I'm not any better than anyone else. I'm not any better than the people lost in those wickednesses, friends. But if we continue in sin, any sin, it is going to cause us to be lost, and we will not be in heaven. I think of the story of Nadab and Abihu. These were two, the two elder or oldest sons of Aaron. That made them nephews of Moses. And next to Moses and Aaron, they held the highest positions in Israel. They were priests of God. They served with their father Aaron. They had heard the voice of God. They had been with Moses and Aaron in the Mount of God. They had seen the God of Israel and did eat and drink. They had been greatly favored, friends, but they weren't profited by their opportunities. Now, in serving this in the service of the sanctuary, fire was used 
fire was used on the altars, fire was used in the incense, and it was a sacred fire that had been kindled by God himself. And they were told never to use anything but this sacred fire in their worship. But in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, we read about what happened to Nadab and Abihu. It says there, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 9, God had commanded the priests to offer no strange incense. But you know, Nadab and Abihu, they must have thought about, well, you know, fire, fire is fire. One fire is as good as another fire. How can you say this fire is better than that fire? God's truth is not so important. They must have reasoned. But just as people reason today about Sunday and the Sabbath, you know, one day is as good as another. Sunday is just as good as Sabbath. I can't see any literal difference. There's no figurative difference. There's no uh, outright difference that people can see easily. And so they think one day is as good as another. But friends, people are going to be lost over this issue. And it's an important issue. And it's important because God says it's important. And so Nadab and Abihu, friends, they reasoned that their truth was at least equal to or greater than God's truth, but they found out it wasn't. And so they offered strange fire, but God took fire and he consumed them. And God's truth was so important that God gave a special message to Aaron and to his sons. In verse 6 of Leviticus 10, he said, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be well the burning which the Lord hath kindled. You see, friends, he was telling them, in effect, don't you even weep. Don't you shed a tear, because if you do, it will make my law look weak before the people. They will think that what I've commanded is not so important. You don't even shed a tear over this issue. Friends, because God's truth, his law is the truth. In Psalms 119 and verse 142, he says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. It must have been hard for Aaron. He just lost two sons. I'm someone who has lost two sons also. I know personally of the anguish of losing not just one son, but two sons. And I tell you, it hurts. It really hurts. It hurts bad. You want to cry. You want to weep. You want to moan and mourn. But friends, Aaron and his other two sons, his, the younger sons, they were not even allowed to do this. And the reason was because God's truth matters. So we ask the question, when does God's truth not matter? Friends, there's never a time. There is never a time when God's truth does not matter. My mind goes forward a little bit in the time of Israel to the time of the kingdom of Saul. In another place, we might want to consider about the life of Saul to see if God's truth really matters. If we are allowed to have our own truth that will triumph or overpower the truth of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we read about a command that was given to Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. It says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Now, let me just stop there. That word hearken. That word hearken in the Bible means more than just to hear. But it means to come under or into submission to what you hear. Many of us who are parents, or when we were younger, maybe, you know, the parent tells the child a command that says, now, do you hear me? And they know quite well they hear everything they're saying in an audible way. The question they're really asking is, are you going to obey me? Verse 2, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came out of Egypt. And then he gave this command in verse 3, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant 
and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and asses. And friends, that must have been a very hard command, it seems, to give. But God had just reasons for this. We understand that these people were a very wicked people, and their cup of, of wickedness was full. They had, as a people, committed the unpardonable sin. They were so wicked that even their children couldn't be saved. Their children had become so vile that they couldn't be saved. And God had to destroy them in mercy to keep them from sinning on and to infecting Israel or infecting other people with sin. And even for their own sake, that they would not continue to live in sin and build up a backlog of sins that they were going to be accountable for in the judgment. But he said, don't even bring the animals back. And we know from archaeological discoveries today that many of those those Canaanite cities, those ancient people, that their animals had venereal diseases. They were sick. And God says, you don't even bring the animals back to them. But, but you know the story. You know what happened, don't you? Saul went out and they killed all the people but the king. They brought King Ag Agag back. And they brought some of what they thought were the best animals back because they were going to put them on the altar and sacrifice them for God's so they said. And this was done, friends, so that they wouldn't have to use their own animals. It was done in a selfish way. And Saul thought that his truth was as good as God's truth or even equal to it. But I want you to notice now what happens in the story in verses 13 and 14. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Well, I've done what you've told me to do. And Samuel said, He's asking now, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? If you did what I told you to do, why do I hear these animals? Because you were to destroy them. You were to exterminate every single one of them. In verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord so great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And friends, I'd like to just say to you today that to obey is better than anything. God told him to obey, and he failed to obey. He thought his truth was better than God's truth, and it wasn't. I want you to notice what God compares supplying Saul's truth for his truth is likened them to. Here in 1 Samuel 15, and verse 23, he, he called Saul's disobedience. He called Saul's acceptance of Saul's truth in the place of God's truth rebellion. And he said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And here's the result of Saul accepting his truth in the place of God's truth. He says, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. The kingdom was rent from Saul and Jonathan, his son, would never become king because of that. And God compared this act of, of, of Saul, of supplying his truth in the place of God's truth. He compared it and said it was a rebellion. It was just like witchcraft. It was equivalent to iniquity and idolatry. And so the kingdom was taken from Saul because, friends, God's truth matters. The truth matters to God. Now, maybe you've never heard of a little boy by the name of Uzzah. Have you ever heard of an Uzzah? I've heard of Jonathan's and Billy's and Samuel's and a lot of names, especially David. But I've never heard of a little boy named Uzzah. And the reason is that God had to kill Uzzah, friends. He had to destroy Uzzah. The ark, we know, had been in the house of Abinadab, and David wanted to move it to Jerusalem. And we read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 3, 4, and 5. It says, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, that was in Gibeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on trimbles and on cornets and on cymbals. And man, what a celebration they had. They were just praising the Lord. They just thought things were great. But friends, there was a problem here. There was a problem. God had specified that only the sons of Kohath, 
were to handle or to work with the ark. It was to be kept covered. It was to be carried with st wooden staves put through rings in the uh, ark. And it was to be carried by the Kohathites upon their shoulders. It was never to be put upon an ox cart like this. Now, of course, we know the Philistines moved the ark on an ox cart back to Israel. But friends, these were people who were in, in ignorance to the, to the commands of God, and God did not impute that iniquity against them. But here are people who knew better, who knew what should happen. But notice what happens in verse 6 now. When they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Certainly, God must have been pleased with you. Well, what Uzzah did. Uzzah had an opportunity, though, friends, to know how the ark was to be moved, and it was not to be touched by common hands. But Uzzah thought that his truth was better than the truth of God on the matter. This is God's sacred ark. I must take care of it. I will take responsibility for this. But, beloved, his truth, and not your truth ever, supersedes the truth of God. And that's why this is so serious. And in verse 7, it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, for his irreverence, the Hebrew says. And he died there by the ark. We're told in the Spirit of Prophecy in the book Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4a, page 111.1, that's 111.1. It says, Uzzah was angry with the oxen because they stumbled. He showed a manifest distrust of God, as though he who had brought the ark from the land of the Philistines could not take care of it. Angels who attended the ark struck down Uzzah for presuming impatiently to put his hand upon the ark. And so Uzzah, friends, was killed because God's truth matters. Friends, God's truth matters. And the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, they illustrated quite well that the truth of God matters. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, speaking of Christ under the, the term word, in the beginning was the word John 1.1. 1, 1. And verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was full of both grace and truth. Jesus, speaking to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, said in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, now notice, true worshipers, true worshipers are those who worship in truth. The true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must, that's an imperative word, must worship him in spirit and in truth. We can claim that it doesn't matter how we serve God, as long as we serve Him in some way. We think it's sufficient. We think our truth is better than His truth. But friends, our truth will never trump or triumph over the truth about God. Jesus, in John 8, verses 31 and 32, said to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Remember we read in John 17, 17, that Jesus prayed to the Father, and he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And here he says, We shall know the truth if we continue in his word, because his word is truth. And that truth will sanctify us. It will make us free from sin, friends. And that's what I want, and I pray it's exactly what you want also. We noted in John 14, 6 again, that Jesus is the truth. In fact, he is the way to the Father. He is the truth about the Father, and He brings the life of the Father to us. And Jesus said that His mission was to come and testify of the truth. When He was on trial with Pilate, it says in John 18, 37, that Pilate therefore saith unto Him, Art thou a king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. 
Well, what a shame that Pilate didn't wait. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and saith unto him, I find in him no fault at all. He knew that there was nothing but truth in Jesus, but he didn't wait to find out the answer to what really is truth. But friends, truth is that which agrees with reality because God is the reality of the universe. God is the reality of the universe. And the life of Christ was a testimony of God's truth and that God is the only truth, the only way, and there is no other truth but him. And Christ's death on Calvary is the seal of God's truth. You see, friends, we live in a fickle, malleable world. This is a picture of Sir Winston Churchill. Perhaps no person could have guided Great Britain through World War II any better than Churchill. And yet, before World War II was ever finally finished, shortly after victory in Europe was assured, Churchill was voted out of being the Prime Minister of England. And people are fickle because they think, well, you know, this changes, that changes, and the economy is changing, and we need some new one to take care of us. But friends, that's the way people look upon the law of God today. They think that the law of God has changed. They think that man may be saved without the sacrifice of Christ. But friends, Christ... Christ's death proves the, the immutability of the law of God. It demonstrated that the wages of sin is death. And when Christ died, the truth of God and the understanding of the truth of God was assured for eternity, and that Satan's destruction was also made certain. You see, if the law could have been abolished, if, if the law could have been done away with, then Christ didn't need to die at all, friends. But because Christ had to die, the law could not be changed. The law had to be met. Jesus came and he died for my sins. He died for your sins. And this is something that we today must understand. Truth is truth. And the truth is so valuable to God that Jesus had to die for it. Our God doesn't change. In John chapter 1, verse 17, we are told that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Friends, God has given us the gift of himself in truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we receive the spirit of truth from the Father and the Son. I want to encourage you to believe the truth. I want to encourage you to cherish the truth. I want to encourage you to obey the truth. You see, friends, there are many people who have an intellectual knowledge of the truth. Many times people are, quote, converted, converted at least to the Advent message. But then we find that their lives don't start to live up to it, or they fail to live up to it, or they start to backslide away from it. And, you know, as a minister, I've, I've met with many people in these situations. And as I talk to them, they, they believe the seventh day is the Sabbath. Some of them even believe that Jesus is still the Son of God. They believe many things. But what I find as I talk to them, I find that they don't love the truth anymore. The Bible says that we must have a love of the truth. And even though they know the truth, they don't love the truth. And they love their own ways more. But friends, we have to love God's way and God's truth and His way. Believe the truth. Cherish the truth. Obey the truth, and you will be thankful that you have the truth. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God. I don't know about you, friends, but I want to hear the word of God. Now, I mentioned earlier that this expression, hearken, it means more than just to hear with an audible voice. It means to come under submission in fact, there's a text in the New Testament in Acts chapter 7 and it says that a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And that word obedient, it comes from a Greek word, hup akuo. It means to hear and come under. To hear and come under. What does that mean? Well, to hear. You hear something and you come under or you come into submission to what you hear. And so when it says faith cometh by hearing, it means more than just, oh, I'm reading John 3.16. I hear John 3.16. It means that I have to not only hear the Word of God, but I must come into obedience to the Word of God. 
and by hearing, this comes through the word of God. And so, beloved, when we have truth, the truth of God, when it comes to us, as soon as any particular truth becomes knowledgeable to us, we are to follow it. And as we follow that truth, God's truth, our faith will increase and, and be strengthened, and we will truly understand what it means to live by faith through obedience to the word of God. But today, we need to understand that God's truth matters. God's truth matters so much that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for you and for me so that we could have eternal life. God's truth mattered in the Garden of Eden with Eve. God's truth mattered at Sodom and Gomorrah. God's truth mattered there in the wilderness with Nadab and Abihu. God's truth mattered with Saul. God's truth matters today. And so I encourage you to follow the truth, to love the truth, and to love the source of all truth, the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Thank you.